Um, yesterday morning, we had our men's breakfast uh, here, and um, uh, Josh Menzies was talking about um, the fact that when it comes to the topic of heaven, uh, it is a comfort to know the reality of heaven, but in many ways, the idea of heaven is just too abstract to really make a difference in our lives. And uh, that's the goal today, to make it less abstract and to help you see the difference, knowing the reality of heaven and hell are coming, but particularly knowing the sweetness and the joy of heaven and knowing how that would change your life. In uh, Revelation chapter 21, we have one of the most vivid descriptions in all the Bible of the future that we are waiting for. A future which if you could just get a glimpse of, uh, a glimpse of where you're heading, it would make a profound difference in your life. One of the ways I talk to my kids about the gospel is, uh, you know, you can start with Jesus dying for you, you can start with your sin, you can start with creation. But I start with where we're going with my kids. And so I say, hey, what is it that we're waiting for, kids? And they're like, we're waiting for Jesus to take us back to his place for a party. That's what we're waiting for. And then I go, why would he want to take us? We're sinful. We've shamed him. We've dishonored him. And they're like, yeah, he died for us to cover our sins so that we might be able to go to his place for a party. And so even as I teach my kids, I'm, I'm... I'm trying to help them realize we're waiting for something. Now, last week, we looked at Jesus' death, his resurrection. But what's the next date on Jesus' calendar? Open up his Google calendar. What's the next um, date in his calendar? It's his return. And he is going to return. He's alive. He's well. He's ascended in heaven. But he's going to return. And he's going to take us to his place for a party. And today, we're going to get a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. So if you've got your Bible, keep it open. We're looking at Revelation chapter 21, and this is how it begins. John, one of Jesus' disciples, he's given a vision of heaven, and this is what he sees. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. First thing we realize here is that this earth is passing away that there is something broken and marred about the world that we live in. It's not the place God meant it to be. Now, it's still very beautiful. The world we live in is still marvelous and gorgeous in so many ways. It's still, many of us think, heavenly, like we live so much for this world. And, uh, and the things of heaven don't capture us the way they should because we've got it so good now. But if you look at the Bible... This is nothing compared to what's going to come. Because the Bible consistently says that this world is, is marred, it's broken, it's dying, it's groaning. There's something wrong with the world around us. And it reminds us that it is this way because we have rebelled against God and we've treated this world not as a gift but as our own And we've used and not cared for the world the way we should. And so the world is passing away. It's dying. It's fading. It's breaking down. And it's falling apart. And it isn't just the world that's fading and falling apart. We are fading and we are falling apart. And there's a sense that we're fading away. We're sagging. We're wrinkling. We're decaying. I, um, in order to keep me alive, I have to inject myself with a medicine every single day into into the subcutaneous fat in my belly just to keep, well, maybe not keep me alive, but otherwise my heart will explode. So probably it is keeping me alive, right? But many of us are like that. It's like I'm 43. I'm like fit, healthy. And, you know, I've got to inject myself with a drug just to keep me from having intense heart pain daily. I remember when that, I was just like, oh, my heart, it's never going to recover. And for so, it. I was 38 when that happened. For some of you, you've had chronic illnesses much earlier, so you've had to come to terms with this earlier. But some of you, you're the top of the world, you're healthy, you're fit, but no, 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 it's coming. Just you wait. <laughs> Something bad's going to happen, right? And um, your, your body's breaking. It's fading. The world we live is passing away. Uh, But not just it's passing away, but there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. 
to come. Now, that is a picture of heaven, which isn't so much the picture that we grew up in. The picture of the new heaven is a new heaven and a new earth, because we are currently living in an earth divorced from heaven, so that God's presence, His power, His blessing doesn't seem to reside on earth. That we're living in a world fractured and broken, and that's because we've rebelled against God. We've been kicked out of the garden, and uh, and so we. But the goal, the hope, is that heaven and earth would reunite. That God would dwell with His people, and it's not so much as you're going to go to heaven, but heaven's going to come to us in a new, resurrected world. And so as you think about heaven, don't think about clouds and playing harps and having no body. No, no, no. The hope of heaven is that you have a real physical body. 1 Corinthians 15 says that just as Christ was raised physically, so too you will be raised physically. You'll have a body that doesn't grow weary. You'll have bodies that walk and never faint. You'll have a body where the beauty on the outside reflects the beauty on the inside. Because in this world, some of the most attractive people in the world, they're incredibly beautiful on the outside, but when you get a glimpse on the inside, they're hideous. And then you have other people in this world who are attractively, stunningly beautiful on the inside, but which their outer shell doesn't really showcase. And the hope of glory is that what is on the outside would be true of what is on the inside. That's what we're waiting for. Bodies which run and swim and dance and play and eat and drink and surf and sleep and stretch and laugh and read and sing. It's going to be physical. A new heaven, God with us on earth. That's the hope. And I've got my eye on a particular house at Bronte Beach, right? That's how you should think about it. This world multiplied by a thousand, it is going to be much like this world, the best things. But remember, this is just a shadow of the glory to come. And we will have bodies like Jesus' own resurrection body. Jesus didn't rise spiritually in our hearts. He rose physically with a body that could walk through walls and you're gonna have a body like that. I can't wait. That is going to be weird, walking through a wall, right? I I think I'll be able to walk on water, so I'll be a lot better at surfing in the new heavens and the new earth. So it's going to be wonderful. And notice the, the detail here. It's going to be new, a new heaven and a new earth. There is a quality of freshness and newness. And sometimes the image I think about is the newness of a morning. You ever been up at the crack of dawn and there's that crack of the dawnness to the morning? There's a new. So last um, Sunday night after Easter Sunday, my eldest daughter Maisie comes to me and says, Dad, you want to go for a swim at Bronte Beach at sunrise tomorrow morning? I said, Yep, sure. So we got up early and uh, we went down to Bronte with a thousand other people. There was just so many people there to catch the sunrise. It was amazing. And it was just fresh, it was crisp. It was clean. It was new. And that's what the new heavens and the new earth are going to be. It's going to be absolutely spectacular and wonderful. But then we're told that there will be no longer, see at the end of that verse down the bottom, and there was no longer any (laughs) sea. Really? <laughs> For reals? Why no longer any C? <sighs> ah. <laughs> so now what's going on here? Now, John's given a vision and he's using language to put into words what can't be put into words. So the, much of this is metaphors. Now, um, sometimes you hear people say, we don't read the Bible literally. No, 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 we do read the Bible literally. Because we believe it's the Word of God and we believe the author has a message which we can understand. We don't be, read the Bible literalistically, meaning that every word has a one-to-one exact correspondence with something uh, real, right? So when, um, uh, um, so here we're being said there's no longer any C. We read it literally. What is the author tr- communicating to us? 
But we understand the author is using a metaphor here throughout the book of Revelation. So I want to understand what he's saying. I don't want to kind of weasel my way out of what he's saying. But uh, I do need to understand what are the literary devices he's using to communicate what he's saying. And he's using a literary device here of metaphor. So I don't read it literalistically. There will no, literally be no longer any oceans. But there's something he's saying here. The sea for Jewish people represented something. It was a symbol of an always changing, never see, very dangerous thing. The seas for Jewish people were places of unrest. They caused destruction and death. They divided the nations. They were a seething cauldron fraught with unlimited possibilities of evil. And so when the book of Revelation says there was a new heaven and new earth and there was no longer any sea in it, it's saying there, was, there is no longer that surging nightmarish force of evil That force of evil, which is tumultuous, that's gone from the world and it's gone from within you. So if John, who wrote the book of Revelation, was lived in Sydney, I think I don't think he would say there was no longer any sea. I think he would say there were there there will be no longer any Sydney thunderstorms. (laughs) That's the image, right? Because for us, Sydney, some of we like ominous, dark, foreboding. Does that make sense? That's what he's saying. And so God will create a new heaven and a new earth for the old earth and the old heaven is fading away and there will be no longer any place of unrest and tumultuous evil, but there will be a place of rest and life and peace and joy. If you belong to Jesus, that is your future. Wonderful, isn't it? Now, is it wishful thinking though? Is this what we hope for? No, because verse 5 says, He who was seated on the throne said, I, I, I am making everything new. So this depends on him. And then he says, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So all of this isn't wishful thinking. It depends on the faithfulness of the God who cannot lie. And this he is committed to, you becoming a new person and you living in a new earth where heaven has come down and dwells with earth. And then verse three, and then I heard a loud voice from the throne, um, a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with his people. Uh, They will be his people and God himself will be with them and he will be their God. So you hear what it's saying? That is the future hope. What makes heaven heaven is not the waves, the food, the wine, the beautiful mountains or whatever it is. What makes heaven heaven is God is there and God will be with his people. And that's what we long for more than anything else. Do you remember in Eden, Adam and Eve walked in the cool of the day with the Lord? There was deep friendship and his face was the first they saw as they woke up. They had communion with God. And when they rebelled, they were kicked out of the garden, away from the presence of God, so that we now live in a world divorced from heaven, where we don't experience the blessing of God, where we don't see the face of God. But in heaven, we will be his people and he will be our God. And that's what will make heaven so wonderful. And because he's there, verse 4 He will wipe every tear from their eyes. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? You know, have you ever wiped a tear from someone's eye? Uh, In order for it's quite lovely, but you can't do that with just anyone. It's like here's a stranger, you see a stranger tie, you say, let me just, (laughs) that would be weird as, right? (laughs) Imagine you see someone at work crying, you're like, oh, wipe that away. Like you can't do that with anyone. I remember uh, a number of years ago, Maisie was eight, Evie would have been, uh, I can't do the maths, five or something, and um, Evie had asked Liz to uh, make her some raisin toast with butter on it, and um, Liz did that, and then Evie starts, you've done it wrong, and she starts screaming and crying, and then Liz starts crying because Evie's crying, and then Maisie starts crying because Evie's crying, mum's crying, and she comes up to me, I was upstairs, and she comes up to me, Dad, I'm really sad because 
Evie asked mum for some raisin toast with butter on it and mum did that. Now she's screaming and yelling and crying and now mum's really sad that Evie's really sad and I'm sad that they're both sad. And I took her in my arms, gave her a big hug. I said, it's all right, I'll go down and talk to Evie. And I wiped her tears from her eyes. Uh, And that's what God our Father does. Whatever you're going through, you go to him and he cares, he embraces you, he loves you, he cares for you, and he makes things better. And notice, he, he doesn't outsource this job to the angels. Uh, it's very personal and very private that as you pass from this life into the next, he has a very private meeting with you where he wipes away all the pain, all the sorrow, and he'll keep this between you and him. It's beautiful. And there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He will eradicate all causes of sadness and usher you into eternal joy. What a promise, yeah? But then comes the challenge. Um, Verse 7, and this is confronting. Are you ready for it? Those who are victorious will inherit all of this and I'll be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So if I understand the Bible correctly here, everyone in this building has a choice of one of two destinies. I think it's very clear from both the teaching of Jesus and the teaching here that if you run the film of your life forward a couple of years, according to the Lord Jesus, either you'll be in the lake of fire or you'll be in the heavenly city. It's very stark. According to Jesus, there are only two roads two destinations, only two kinds of people in the world. And this is very challenging, very hard. I wish I could give you more options. But according to Jesus, this is it. Now, how do we think about this? Well, think about this with me for a moment. Heaven, what is heaven? Heaven is where we come to Jesus, where we live with Jesus, where we love Jesus, where we will worship Jesus, where we'll know Jesus, where he'll feed us and care for us and provide for us and house us. See, if you reduce heaven down, it's, it is a place, it's physical, it's embodied, but more than a place, it's a person. It's where Jesus is. That's what makes heaven heaven. And it's curious to me that heaven is the place where Jesus is and therefore it makes sense, perfect sense, that to get there, then you have to have a relationship with him. You have to love him. See, why in the world would we think that we have the right to just sort of invade God's house, to live with God, to eat with God, to hang out with God when we don't really like God, where we kind of ignore God, where we hear God say stuff and we're just like, no, I'm not going to do it that way. So you'd, you would be very hard-pressed to have someone come and live in your house who completely ignored you. They lived in your house, ate from your fridge, contributed nothing, and yet, you know, they were, uh, they despised you, they ignored you, they spoke ill of you, they didn't care about the things you care about. You wouldn't let them move into your house. See, the people you'd let in your house to stay in your house are family, they're friends, they're people you love and who love you. And in the same way we think of heaven, everyone should be there. Everyone wants to be there. And we have this assumption that, it, that anyone can go there even if they're not friends with Jesus, which is really silly. Because you can't just move into anyone's house, anyone's house if you don't have a relationship with them. See, we get into heaven. Heaven is not so much a place you're going. It's a person that you're in relationship with who is preparing a place for you. And you're going to that place to be with him. And if you don't like him, you don't love him, you don't want to worship him, 
then why would you want to be there with him? And he's not going to let you come into that place. And as a result, the, the opposite of that is described as a lake of burning sulfur. Now, again, you've got to realize this is metaphorical language. I don't think it's literally going to be, literalistically, <laughs> going to be a lake of burning sulfur. I think John is searching for words to describe just how awful life without Jesus would be. And so he finds this very graphic metaphor and he says, life without Jesus is like a lake of burning sulfur. It's horrendous. Um, but that's because God's not there. Uh, I've, I've heard people describe, um, so, you know, imagine you're married and your husband or your wife cheats on you and then goes and lives with that person they've cheated you on. I could imagine someone saying, Toby, it feels like a lake of burning fire what I'm going through. What are they saying there? They're saying the pain of being separated from someone I've loved and they've betrayed me, it's painful. It's like a lake of burning sulfur. And I think that's why the Bible uses this language. To be away from the God who made you, who you will never be satisfied until you are with him, it's absolute torment. I don't think God's there with the pitch fork stoking the fires, right? I don't think that's the picture we get of God. I think he's separating those who don't love him, who will just cause trouble in his place, who will keep rebelling. have got no, you know, he's like, well, guys, you can't come into this. You'll ruin it for everyone else. I mean, why would you want to be with me? And so that's what's going on. It's a sobering thought, but this is your eternal destiny, and I have to ask you, are you friends with Jesus? Because this is what's, I mean, I don't know. The Bible, we kind of think the Bible is full of fire and brimstone, you know, a lot of, but it actually isn't full of a lot of warnings. It's usually telling us how good what Jesus has come to offer us is, and then occasionally it'll warn you. Like, what's on offer should be enough for us to go, heck yeah, I'm in. But occasionally, Jesus will say, here is what will happen if you keep ignoring my rightful claim over your life. I'm your king. I'm your creator. I'm your savior. And if you keep re refusing that, here's the warning. And so he makes it very clear who enters, those who are friends with him, and who doesn't. And notice the first on the list of who doesn't. Verse 8, but the cowardly. Now, isn't that interesting that the first group of people who end up away from the presence of God, are cowards. And that's because in some measure, to be a Christian requires courage. And perhaps one of, if not the greatest thing that keeps people from putting their trust in Jesus is they're afraid of what people will think of them. And maybe that's what's stopping you. And sadly, it's the cowards who are first to be removed from the presence of God because they cared too much about what others thought and they didn't care about their soul. So there is the picture of heaven according to Revelation chapter 21. Now, in our remaining time, I just want to uh, apply this in two directions. And the first uh, direction I want to apply is, how does the vision of heaven and eternity shape and make a difference in our lives? Well, first of all, it, uh, it sets our priorities. It changes our priorities. Now, you're wondering, what is all this garage sale going on up the front here? That's what Al Stewart said. Are we having a garage sale? Someone else said, is this lost property? Hey? Two bucks for the camera. Bucks for the camera. <laughs> Not sold. <laughs> all right. So I, I heard um, a number of years ago, uh, I heard a preacher do this, and it made a difference. Um, I've got all these uh, orange dots, and on them is written the word temporary. And everything you have in life, whether it's a cool little hat, whether it's um, your recreational efforts, free diving, whether it's games you played as a kid, whether it's surfing, everything in your life is temporary. It's all fading. And we give ourselves constantly to all of these things. We spend so much money and time on building houses, our youthfulness is temporary, sadly. 
and my skill on a skateboard is very temporary. Fashion, the fashions come and go. Fashion is temporary. Does anyone know what this is? It's a hydro flask. Go back three years and more than anything else, my daughter wanted a hydro flask. But then the year changed and then more than anything else, she wanted a Frank Green. And then this year, more than anything else, Dad, I want a Stanley. <laughs> Anyone else here like it? The fashions keep changing over and over. Fashion is temporary. Our health and wellness, temporary. The gadgets we have in life, they're temporary. Everything in your life is fading away. It's passing away. And yet we spend so much time accumulating. Oh, I need this in order to feel satisfied. And we spend and yet we re remain empty and unfulfilled. We live in this world in Sydney for that which is temporary, constantly filling our lives with these things. And the reality is in this room, there is only one thing that lives forever, right? And that's you guys. You, Eileen. You, Mitch. You, Al Stewart. I wish I could go through the rest of the congregation, but... Have we forgotten there is one thing that lasts forever, one thing that is eternal, only one item that will be allowed you to take with you when you die? See, the person next to you lives forever. And when you get to the end of your life and you take your last breath, what will people, what, what will people say your life was about? You know, great... Holidays, ah, oh, they're constantly traveling, right? On temporary, right? Who cares about that? There is one thing which is eternal and one thing will last and one thing will make you rich in the eyes of God. And the problem of living in Sydney is we are persistently thrown by the urgent things, the temporary things, so that we forget the forever things. And we invest our time and money and our satisfactions in things that are here and then gone tomorrow? Have you failed to invest your life upon that which lasts forever? One day you're going to die. What will they say about you? And as great as you can achieve things in life, accumulate experiences, accumulate wealth, all of that will be a blip on the radar of eternity. You'll become dust one day and the only thing you'll take with you is your faith in Jesus and anyone you shared that with. If you bring glory to Christ and live for his, that last, Jesus says that if you offer a cup of water in his name to someone, that lasts, that will be known for eternity. See, we are eternal creatures. Life is just a moment. You need to get this perspective that here and now I don't belong. This isn't my home. And that shifts you from being, that shifts you from living a life where possessions consume you. It's just a moment. Be freed. So that's the first thing. You get this eternal mindset, it'll set your priorities. And then the second thing, it'll give you courage because life in the world in Sydney, we are obsessed with safety, feeling secure feeling financially independent, uh, feeling not at threat of anything, and yet, ironically, we're the safest people who have ever lived. And you see this, you see the difference this eternal hope makes when you research the early church. So here's a book Rodney Stark wrote, The Rise of Christianity. And Rodney Stark, he wasn't a Christian, and uh, he was a sociologist of religion, and he did a historical study of the early church and how Christianity went from 5 6% of the Roman Empire to 50% uh, dominant religion in the Roman Empire over a period of 100 years. And he's like, how did that happen from a sociological point of view? He wasn't a Christian when he started writing, and I think he ended up becoming a Christian after a bunch of his research because he's like, this cut doesn't make sense. And, uh, and so he looked at the early church and he's trying to work out why did Christianity grow so rapidly? And one of the reasons was because of the way Christians responded to the plagues. In Rome, there are two significant 
plagues, one in 165 AD and one in 251 AD, and both of them last for about 15 years. Not sure what it actually was. Could have been smallpox, could have been measles, but it absolutely devastated the population of Rome. And, uh, and we know that roughly 5,000 people were dying in the city of Rome, 35,000 people per week in a population of a city of 1 million people. So imagine Sydney, a quarter of its size and 35,000 people dying every single week. And uh, about 25 to 30% of the whole population of the city, the Roman Empire was wiped out during these plagues. So that's what was happening. And they didn't know how to cure it. They didn't have any preventative measures, but they did know that you wouldn't get the plague if you avoided contact with people. So they knew, okay, avoid contact with people with the plague. And so what ended up happening is if you're wealthy enough to leave the city, you had means to survive out in the countryside, then you just left. And we have all these stories of people who are wealthy just leaving their families. As soon as their families got, they left. They left them to die in the cities. They abandoned them one after the other. But the Christians didn't do that. They stayed in the city. And not only did they look after their own sick, their own family members, but they started all of these nursing services. They went out and they brought in uh, all of the pagan sick, all of the people that weren't part of their family, weren't part of their religion, and they started caring for them. And many of the Christians died in the process of caring for these people. Now, why that difference? Is it because Christians are better than others? No, that's not true. We're not better. We're not more loving. We're not more courageous than anyone else. But there was a difference. So how do you account for that difference? And the difference is in worldview. Because the pagans in Rome at the time, they didn't believe in life after death. They, they had no idea whether there was such a thing. And people weren't made in the image of God. And the body, it's a dirty thing. It's not very good. The goal is to leave the body. And, and so their worldview trained them to not be willing to risk their life for the good of others. Whereas the Christian's worldview is here is a person made in the image of God. They're sick and dying. I must care for that person. And more than that, while they're afraid of dying, they weren't afraid of death. So they're willing to risk their life. And here's what Rodney Stark says. He looked at this Dr. Gallen who left the cities. He was wealthy, left the cities, because he knew if he stayed and cared for the sick, he'd die. And this is what Rodney Stark says. He says, Gallen lacked... Gallen lacked belief in life beyond death. The Christians were certain that this life was but prelude. For Gallen to have remained in Rome to treat the afflicted would have required bravery far beyond that need by Christians to do likewise. Now, that's an interesting sentence, isn't it? For Gallen to have stayed, he would have needed more bravery, more courage than the Christians who stayed behind. Now, why more? Wouldn't it just be the same level of courage? And Rodney Stark saying, no, 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 that he would require more bravery because here's what he's saying. He's saying, it's not as though Christians were more courageous. The Christians had the gospel. And the gospel took very ordinary people and gave them a reason for staying put, a reason for risking their life to serve others. But the pagans, they didn't believe in life after death. They believed that today is all you have, that earth is all you have. Why would they risk their life if this is all they have? And so he's saying for Gallen to have stayed, for him to risk the only thing that he has, and then death is the end, that would require tremendous courage. Whereas for the Christians who believe death is just the entrance into the presence of Jesus, they didn't need as much courage. Do you get what he's saying there? You see, heaven gives you a reason to be able to make sacrifices here on earth, to live sacrificially, to live generously, to minister to others, to serve others. Heaven gives you courage to minister to others because, you know, this is not the end. See, some of you, you're not answering the call of God on your life because you're afraid 
of what people might think of you, afraid of what you would lose if you gave your time, your money, your resource, your reputation to Jesus. See, you are rich. You're rich in time. You're rich in financial resources. You have reputations and names. You have contacts. You have words. You have abilities. You are incredibly powerful people. The question is, are you using all of what you have for that which is eternal, for that which lasts forever? And I, you know, um, are you using your money to do that? See, many people don't, and that's because they're afraid. They don't have the courage of knowing heaven's their true home. So they cling to the things of this earth. They can't get rid of it. So how would you know you're generous? Well, historically, generosity was measured in a person's life of whether they gave 10% or more away to the things of Jesus. See, for you and I, we live at a time where 10% would significantly eat into our discretionary spending. But if you go back 500 years, 10% would seriously eat into not their discretionary spending, but their necessitous spending. It would stop them from being able to buy as much grain in order to store for winter so that they had enough food to eat during winter. They'd really have to trust God. And yet we struggle to trust God with our finances because that might mean we're not able to do this trip overseas in September this year. But that's because we've lost sight of heaven. It's like, that's what really matters. You know, if I don't get to travel to Europe before I die, so what? I'm going to have a new heaven and a new earth to explore. It's not, you only, YOLO, you only live once. No, you don't. We're going to live forever, right? I don't have to cram in everything into this life. Now, that's not to mean you don't enjoy life. Hopefully, you know I enjoy life. I, I had a great long service leave earlier this year. Let me tell you, right? Um, but... Um, it's not everything to me. And I'm very cautious of what's an appropriate amount to spend on this because I want to be giving to the cause of Jesus. So with your money, be givers, be joyful and generous, invest in eternity. And there are so many options for you to do that. I preached um, on this passage last in 2015. And in 2015, Vine Church was meeting at Crown Street Public School. We were a church plant, a startup church. We're meeting over there, and this church here uh, had a very small congregation meeting here, and the minister moved on, and they had no minister, and so they invited us to bring our church plant from the school into this uh, building here. And Rian was there, and a bunch of us were around at that time. And we came into these buildings, and they were incredibly run down, incredibly broken, not very inviting to our local community. And I went back to my sermon on this passage this week as I was preparing for this. I'm like, what did I say? And this is what I wrote in 2015. We'd just moved in. And I said this to the congregation. I said, this week I gathered a team of people to help us think through how we will use these buildings at St. Michael's. We've moved our office space into the, into the house but there's lots of work to do to make it clean, open, and inviting and functional for ministry. And then I said this, imagine, imagine a space where there's plenty of room for kids' ministry on a Sunday. Imagine teenagers gathering here on Friday nights to learn about Jesus. Imagine community groups meeting here throughout the week, studying the Bible and sharing lives with one another. Imagine people came, come here on a Tuesday night for Christianity Explored or Life or Alpha. Imagine mothers gathering in our playground on Thursday mornings for mini movers. Imagine a place where we could host art shows and live music, where we host regional seminars on things like marriage and parenting and climate change and Christian social responsibility, where community groups like Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous and debt counselling can take place here, where hundreds of people on the margins get fed every Sunday morning and where leaders are trained to teach the Bible to others. And I said to that generation of Vine Church, 
You can make an eternal difference in the lives of people if you give generously to this work. Now, here's that generation of Vine Church, they gave generously. You are the beneficiaries of that. This beautiful, new, renovated building, you benefit from that. But the question is, what will this generation of Vine Church do? We had more people than ever at Easter. People are exploring the Christian faith here. Our youth ministry is growing. Our kids' ministry is growing. You have such an amazing opportunity to see that happen. Our vision is to see more people worshipping Jesus in church on a Sunday than people at the Beresford on a Friday night. People just think this life's all there is, so let's go out and get drunk, do lines of coke, and have lots and lots of sex, right? That's what they think. They, they don't know there's a real heaven and a real hell. And we have this precious opportunity to bring people to Jesus and give them life. Will you make an investment in what really matters? See, if you're a Christian, you really are going to be in heaven one day. And people really will come up to you on that last day and they'll say, you don't know me, but you gave money so that I could hear the gospel of Jesus. We never met on earth. But I was at a place that you gave your money to and that's where I heard the gospel for the first time. That's gonna happen one day. And so are you using your resource to make that happen? I don't really care if you give to Vine Church, right? Just find somewhere to give your money that's preaching the gospel that you might building for eternity. Um. I got one more illustration. I was te- trying to work out whether to do this one. This one's a little bit self-serving. And uh, anyway, I got to, um, yeah, let me do this. This is a good wrap up. Um, a couple of years ago, the greatest sporting moment in history happened. Does anyone know what the greatest sporting moment in history was? It was Kelly Slater at age 50 won the Pipeline Masters surfing com- competition. Now, uh, you've got to understand, Kelly Slater, he, he, this was a week out from his 50th birthday. He was surfing against a guy half his age at the world's premier surfing spot, Hawaii Pipeline. And he's almost 50, right? Everyone's like, you're never going to win another comp ever again, right? It's 30 years. It was 30 years since he won his first competition. And anyway, he hits uh, round two and he's surfing really well. Gets into round three, I think it is. And he's up against the Hawaiian Baron Mamiya. And uh, the clock's counting. He needs to get a 7.4 and there's 10 seconds left on the clock. And then this wave comes through. I've got a video. 10 seconds to go. Pulls into this barrel. Gets spat out. He's just like, whoa. Right, he gets a nine point ride for that. You don't seem that excited, guys. <laughs> so, one week from his 50th birthday, he ends up in the final of the Pipeline Masters. This is like Kelly Slayer, he's a big deal in surfing, right? Everyone loves him. And we're like, could he win? Could he win? He's up against Seth Moniz, half his age, and a Hawaiian as well. You're like, come on, Kelly, come on, Kelly. And then he gets this wave in the final, takes off. Late, drops, almost gets lipped in the head, doesn't, pulls in, comes out after the spray, and uh, he's absolutely, absolutely, here's another angle on this. I told you this was a bit self-serving. Just an amazing wave, comes out, and uh, he's in tears. Every grown man across the world who loves surfing in this moment is just in tears, jumping up and down in their... I remember where I was. I was in my lounge room, jumping up and down, hugging anyone I could find, telling everyone about how amazing this moment was. He was in tears. I was in tears. The greatest moment in surfing sports history ever. Now, here's the thing. Uh, If that is how excited I get jumping up and down for a guy who is riding a piece of foam on water, how much more glorious will it be when I'm in the presence of millions and millions of people jumping up and down, singing the praise of King Jesus, who gave his life to save us from our sin and death. It will be wonderful, right? Heaven is going to be amazing. I want to be there as close to the front as possible. 
There is a day coming where there will be a vast stadium of people that you are sitting in. And someone will be reading the books of life and your name will be called out. And I can imagine myself walking down the steps to the front, incredibly anxious. What are they going to say? And in this moment, I'm either facing the fires of hell or the pleasures of heaven. That's what it's, it's at stake. As you walk up to the stage, there you see your Savior. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. He wraps you up in a hug. That moment will last with you for an eternity. That's what we're talking about. Absolutely glorious. I don't think we think enough about heaven. I don't think we remind each other enough about heaven. And I think that's because this is pretty good, Sydney. But this is what we're waiting for. We're waiting for Jesus to come and take us to his place for a party. It's glorious. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for this reminder of what's at stake, what's on offer, what you promise us. New heavens, new earth, no more churning, anxious seas, that which threatens us. The old order of things passed away. No more crying, no more, pain, no more pain, that you will wipe the tears from our eyes. But that is for your friends. And Father, there are some in this room who aren't sure where they stand with you. Would you show them the generosity of what you're offering them? And would they feel a sense of fear that if they're not friends with you, their destiny's in peril? Please open their eyes, change their hearts, cause them to search out the things that you're teaching us in, the, in your word here so that they might be safe on that last day. And Father, for those of us who are safe, help us to rejoice in this. Keep us from making this our home Help us to remember this is temporary and help us to give our, thing, our, our lives to the things that are forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.